right, what is up, Chargers fans? Welcome to the Get These Chargers podcast. My name is Steven, and I'm your host, as always. And joining me is my guy, Tyler. Tyler, what's up, man? How are you doing tonight? I'm doing fantastic. The Chargers play a real game that doesn't count in just a few days. I'm excited, man. <laughs> a real game that doesn't count. You know, hey, you know, we are... Uh, we're recording this on Monday, August 7th. It's I think it's officially a month away from the season, or that might have been yesterday. I can't remember. Either way, uh, regular season is, is closing in, so uh, I'm excited to get to, uh, get to that point. Excited to cover the, the preseason game. Uh, so today we have a great show planned for you guys. Uh, we have an interview with Eric Kendricks, the Chargers linebacker, and had a great conversation with him. Uh, we recorded that on Saturday after that practice, so... Uh, that was before the scrimmage, and uh, today's show is going to be all about recapping the scrimmage that happened on Sunday night. So Tyler and I had the privilege of uh, being there in person. We'll have some of our thoughts there, along with that interview with uh, Eric Hendricks. Yeah, very excited um, to show you guys the Eric Hendricks interview, interview and then talk about the scrimmage. I was really excited to just be there in the stands and actually look at you know what some real sort of Chargers football could look like, and um, plenty of takeaways, some good, some bad. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, this was uh, my wife's first time at uh, along the fence line uh, at training camp this weekend. So uh, she had a great time and uh, missed out on some autographs, but got some great videos of, of Eric Kendricks, of Derwin James, of Justin Herbert. So um, had a great time there. And, and a special thanks to, to everybody who made that happen. And then, uh, of course, thanks to the Chargers for having us out uh, at training camp these past two weekends. It's been great for us. Great experience. Um, could not be more appreciative of the opportunity to be out there, you know, on the field and, and interviewing these players in person was a, was a great time. Um, that being said, before we get to this interview, Tyler and I are fans of the team first and foremost. We have been given this platform and we're super, super thankful for it. Uh, but the opinions that we express on this show and every week on this show are not always reflective of the Chargers organization. Um, at the end of the day, we are fans and uh, we have this platform just like... Uh, you know, very appreciative of that opportunity. So that being said, let's get to this interview with Eric Kendricks, and then we'll come out on the other side and we'll recap this Chargers scrimmage. So that being said, here is Mr. Eric Kendricks. All right, guys, welcome back to the Guilty as Charged podcast here today with linebacker Eric Kendricks. Eric, thanks for uh, taking the time today. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. How are you? Uh, we're doing fantastic. Great day of camp here today. Uh, you know, kind of week two in the books here. How, how's the vibe right now for you? Five is our high. Um, defense did a you know better job today in the two minute. Um, feeling good. Uh, still still have a lot to work on, but um, you know um, personally I feel like I'm starting to understand the playbook a little bit better. Um, seeing my, my my reads and my keys a little bit faster. So everything's good, man. We got a big day tomorrow. Yeah, you're a veteran in this league, but you have the green dot responsibility that puts so much more stress on you. How are you working through that, working through the green dot guy, and also trying to learn this defense? Yeah, you know it's just the communication. Um, for sure, uh, you know, me, me, my communication with the coach, and then also, you know, my com communication through the team. You know, getting, getting, getting what I need to get to them uh, fast, and um, you know, and, and making those adjustments when we need to as well. Like, you know, just playing off each other. Yeah, yeah. I think there's there's a ton of energy on defense today from what we saw. Um, Asante had himself a day. It felt like. What have you seen from him as as kind of a a young guy that's maybe on the rise right now? Man, I think he's had uh, probably one of the best camps you know out of everybody um, so far. Uh, I think that year three is when things start to click as a as a young player. You know, um, and I think that it's like when your when your confidence is at its highest and everything like that, um, you start to understand concepts a little bit more. You've seen a little bit now that he's been in the league for a while, so it only makes sense. Um, I'm just just uh, excited to see what he does from, from here on out. Yeah, as we are, absolutely. Um, another player that's being played excellent so far, who's improving every single day, is Kenneth Murray. How is he picking your brain right now? Because I think you're the most experienced linebacker he's ever played, but so how is he, what's he asking you? How is he picking your brain? Man, Kenny's, uh, you know, I'm asking him things right now. You know, he's, <laughs> he's, the, he's the one that's been a year in this defense. You know, he has a lot of experience in this league. Um, you know, we both have our own experiences, and, you know, I try to share my experiences with the group. But, um, you know, I think that it's just our energy in the huddle together and on the field together and just uh, just be able to bounce ideas off each other. And, uh, you know, really just I mean, we got to we got to we got to work me and him. You know, we got to we got to we got to yeah. we got to be the leaders of that defense, you know, yeah. and uh, I think that um, I think with our experience going into this year and uh, how, how much fun we're having already, it's, it's only going to just show on the field. Yeah, I love the way that you guys are communicating off the field as well. Um, Brandon talked a couple weeks ago about his experience with like the Mike Zimmer defense and how he's trying to relate that to you on a on a weekly basis, daily basis. Um, for those who might not know, like what kind of 
similarities there are between his Zimmer's defense and this defense. What can you tell us about that? I think that there he uh, you know there's a lot of uh, concepts that they're adapting. You know that I'm, I'm very familiar with, or maybe I have a lot of experience with, um, going back to my first seven years in the league, which is great for me. Um, but also there's a lot of new concepts and some that kind of overlap, but maybe have new terminology or they have little wrinkles. And that's what he's been doing is kind of explaining them to me in my old terms, but also, you know, the new wrinkles and, and the nuances of, of how we play it here. Um, some things are, are, are easier for me to pick up and I can pick up right away. And some things are going to take a little bit more of an adjustment for mm -hmm. me. So I'm, I'm, that's what I've been working on. And that's what I've been picking up. And today I remember I had a, I had a rep. Uh, um, it was very, very, a very casual rep, but, uh, I played something a little bit differently because I actually knew where mm -hmm. I had help versus where I used to not have help. So it's it's little things like that where I, I, I'm starting to find um, my, my way in this defense. Derek Ansley, the new defensive coordinator, what teaching strategies is he using to kind of help you guys maybe recognize what you just did? Yeah, you know, I think that uh, it's important to, to go over the little things as well and the fundamentals of, of, of uh, the structure of how we have uh, our defense built. Mm -hmm. um, day to day, you know, um, the statistics going into our practices and things like that because uh, we're trying to get better every day. So um, I think that they're, they're just uh, they're being they're, they're on us very critically, but also, you know, um, they want us to play free and fast. Yeah, I love to hear that. Um, last year, if you look at kind of like blitz rates and things like that, it's very interesting to see like where you were versus where you are now. In terms of those blitz packages that Staley likes to come up with in you know, third downs in particular, how's that adjustment been for you? It's been great. You know, I'm, I'll, uh, I think that we have a lot of good pressures and a lot of good looks. Obviously, we have we have a great front, and you know, um, yeah. a lot of times we're just going to rely on those guys to, to you know to get to the pass rusher because we have to cover or do you know show show pressure and drop. You know, we can, we we have so much versatility, and that's the whole point. You know, you want to yeah. you want to keep the offense on their toes and kind of um, you know. Uh, Make put things on our terms versus you know being you know being on our heels and having it be on their terms. So uh, yeah. I think the more the more looks we can show, um, the more the more blitz pressures we can get, the more we can actually get four man four man pressures and, and actually get sacks in the, in the in the four man game as well. Yeah, one coach I, I can't stop asking about is Ryan Ficken, who you obviously played with and for in, in um, Minnesota. Yeah, I think you had over 500 special team snaps in Minnesota, which I didn't know. But what's it like <laughs> working? Yeah, there you go. It must be I must be like. Uh, <laughs> You know, kickoff uh, or block. It was a um, uh, PAT was, uh, block. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah. field goal block. Yeah, field exactly. Goal block, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> a couple of punt returns. I'm not yeah, going to ask about A lot about of punt returns, for sure. Yeah, for um, sure. Defensive stays, things like that. Yeah, what's it like, though? Like, he's such a special coach, and the way he recognizes, like, different coaches, different players, he's so special as a coach. What was it like just working with him and then seeing him out here? I think that it's cool to see his progression. You know, I think when uh, I started with him in Minnesota, he was an assistant, and, mm -hmm. you know, um, he's adapted a lot of things from. Uh, you know that coach but at the same time you know he's become his own as well and uh the thing that i love most about him is that you know he knows that he doesn't have every answer he knows that there's going to be things that are going to be happening on the fly and um he's up to take suggestions from the players to see how maybe we can best do things to to be uh successful out there mm -hmm. um, on the field and um use people's strengths to their strengths you know and uh get get the job done so i, I like that yeah love to hear that um obviously we're recording this on saturday scrimmage tomorrow What's what's the main focus for you as we uh, kind of transition into the next the next stage of training camp here? Um, my, my my focus is just conditioning and, and communication. You know, obviously, um, you know, being that leader, getting getting the you know, getting the, the calls in, getting the calls to the defense. You know, um, doing my job first and foremost, and doing it at a high level, but also getting in shape for to, for the season and. Um, you know, communication becomes a you know a factor when that when that when that's an issue. Yeah, absolutely. You've played over a thousand snaps the last two seasons. Like, what is the secret to longevity at this position where there's so much wear and tear on your body? I think that it's just uh, never expecting that you have all the answers. Always being open to different types of treatment options, mm -hmm. and um, you know, just creating a routine for yourself. Like, I was telling some of the guys, you know, you got to just put things in place just to where, you know, when you finish practice, you have a massage set up. You have a you know, you go see your chiropractor. Like. Those appointments need to be set in stone throughout mm. the season, so you don't even have to think about them. You know, it becomes part of your schedule, just like going to practice, just like showing up for work. And um, I think that that, uh, that along with uh, Pilates has just changed changed my whole uh, my wow. whole career. Uh, did you happen to watch your former quarterback on the Netflix series? Uh, I've wa I watched here in spots spots here and there. Um, I was just hilarious. asking because he like he has that chiropractor set up and like I don't know if you mm -hmm. saw, but. Um, I think like general fans don't realize how much goes into taking care of your body on a yearly basis as an NFL player. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, I'm talking about like, you know, up, uh, two massages, sometimes three a week, you know, two acupuncture, a chiropractor visit, um, Pilates session, maybe once or twice a week. 
Um, right. That's just during the regular season, you know, amongst practice and other things. Um, day, my days off are you're not really days <laughs> off, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but it's what it's what you got to do, you know. It's yeah. it's I'm I'm out here gonna get 100 plus tackles a season, you know, 130 hopefully, mm. 100 plus, you know, hopefully not too many because that means we're not playing good defense, but. Um, <laughs> I got to take care of my body to be there for my team. So it's just it's just what is what it is at this point. You know, you create a routine, you stick to it, and you get the job done. All right, last question for me. What is the secret to the perfect elephant noise? Because what you did for that, <laughs> that sign was you gotta fantastic. Have a, you got to have a great mother, you know what I mean? And you got to have a um, – you got to have a little bit of confidence going doing that. Okay. You know, I feel like uh, my mom used to always do it when we were kids, so yeah. I just naturally picked it up. Love it. Love it. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Well, Eric, this has been great, man. Thanks so much for your time. Chargers fans, hope you enjoyed that one because we sure did. And uh, we'll talk soon for sure. All right, Tyler, any uh, any final thoughts from uh, that interview with Mr. Eric Kendrick before we get started here on the scrimmage recap? Yeah, just the, the notion that Kenneth Murray has become an expert or enough of an expert in this defensive scheme that – Kendrick said he's the one who's asking him questions. Um, and that really doesn't seem to be part of this, you know, like fluff talk for a player, right? Like, sure, training camp, off season, a lot of fluff talk, right? But it really feels like Murray's, you know, backing everything up, all the praise that he's getting from his coaches, from his teammates. He's been crushing it, and he was one of the guys that killed it at the scrimmage. Yeah, and he had a great day on uh, Saturday as well, you know, including a, a pick six when we were there. So, um, all things trending positive for Kenneth Murray and excited to see that come to fruition. You know, him mm-hmm. and, uh, and Eric Kendrick seem to be de- developing a, a great rapport. Um, you know, Derwin James had this quote on Sunday night that basically when you see one of the linebackers, you always see the other. Um, so the two of them being attached to the hip is fantastic. I love to hear that. And uh, both guys really have made a, a very strong impact thus far in training camp. Yeah, they have. Murray's been fantastic. Kendrick's has been so far, everything that we've wanted, not just from a, a player perspective, but from a, a role model, from that experienced veteran perspective. So, uh, yeah, again, I'm really excited. Won't see them in the preseason, I, I can't imagine, but I'm excited to see them week one. Yeah, but maybe we'll see uh, Mr. Dayon Henley get some run in yeah. those preseason games, which, which should be fun. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, let's get to this scrimmage recap. Uh, similar to, similarly to how we've been doing um, all throughout the show, we're going to give some uh, rotational thoughts, some standouts, some some uh, broader takeaways as well um, from the scrimmage that happened on Sunday evening. Um, first and foremost, have to talk about some of the uh, health issues that have been going around with the Chargers. Um, there's been some illnesses going around the team. So um, Quentin Johnston, Joey Bosa, Rashawn Slater, and Gerald Everett did not participate in the scrimmage on a Sunday night. That's obviously you know a pretty heavy uh heavy impact rotation of of players um and, and so we'll dive into some of the those ramifications then um there were some players who were injured as well JC Jackson which is a a normal recovery soreness issue from him and then Sebastian Joseph Day has a quad injury that he suffered on Saturday um so he did not participate in the scrimmage um, and then Dustin Hopkins was revealed as dealing with a physical issue as well. So mm-hmm. Cameron Dicker was the only kicker who participated in the scrimmage and had a fantastic day, which we can get into down the road. But there were some other injuries as well. Um, you know, an important one that that definitely affected the scrimmage was Mr. Zach Bailey, who has been kind of operating as the fourth offensive tackle, fourth guard kind of position. Um, he did not practice either. So. Those were some of the issues in terms of health that the Chargers had in, in the scrimmage. Um, and, and like I said, had some, some pretty big ramifications on what uh, transpired on Sunday evening. Yeah, uh, plenty of players missing. Some were surprises. Like I didn't expect Quentin Johnson to not be out there. Some were expected. And I guess it, it, I'm thankful, I suppose, we got some clarification on Dustin Hopkins because yeah, after a while we started to go through the days that he wasn't kicking it. Suddenly you realize, oh, it's been a week. Oh, it's been almost two weeks. So... I guess good to get some clarification there. But, yeah, it it really did change for both sides of the football, you know, who was out there and how they performed. The difference is one of these units was able to overcome the players that were missing that day. Yeah, yeah. And so let's dive into that. I think um, on a broader scope, this was a very defensive heavy scrimmage, um, which doesn't necessarily get a lot of cheers from the crowd, but I think <laughs> in itself is definitely something to be you know positive about. And, and so we can frame that from a positive perspective. Um, it was a very defensive heavy performance, at least for the first f- you know few series. The teams would basically go fir- first team against first team, second team against second team, and then the third teams kind of got in there. 
um, you know, kind of at the end. But basically, I would say for the first six series, this was a defensive dominant performance. And then the offense kind of got some rhythm finally at the end of the scrimmage, um, which ended with a two-minute drive touchdown to Keenan Allen. And then, or I'm sorry, a red zone touchdown drive to Keenan Allen, and then a two-minute drive that um, resulted in a Cameron Dicker field goal. So, Tyler, from a, a broader scope here, what was your biggest takeaway from the scrimmage on Sunday night? Ooh, there's two. And I might let you get to the offensive line one. So, for me, I'll stick with the defense, and that is that – you know, these opportunities in the preseason too, you get to see the depth of the roster and you don't really always get to see these guys perform. And there are some guys who will dress on the preseason and maybe not even play. But on Sunday, we got to see a lot of these defensive players get out there that we haven't really seen. And, or maybe we haven't even seen them much in, in true action because there's no padded practice or we weren't there. So we finally got to see a lot of these guys down the depth chart. And I'm just noticing... DBs, defensive line, you name it. Everyone on defense is feasting, and that to me is an indication of great teaching. And that's something that we've really mm-hmm. kind of picked up on with talking to Eric Smith, you know, reading the coaching interviews. And that's something that Brandon Staley has prioritized anyway. But, you know, you can take an A student, and that student will get an A. You can take Khalil Mack, and he's going to look good. You know, but what can you do with the, the players or the, or the students? that are not the A student or the, the, the stars or the players that are not stars. What can you do with those players? And yet I'm looking through the rotation and, you know, granted, it's not like these guys were all playing the first team, but Carlo Kemp, Ty Shelby, Andrew Farmer, Brevin Allen, Gerard Clark, David Moa, these guys combined for nine pressures, four sacks, one forced fumble, another pressure that resulted in that pick six to Mark Webb, two run stops and two tackles for loss. None of those guys are drafted, and most of those guys are in their first year in the league or their second year in the league. So from Brandon Staley to Derek Ansley to Giff Smith, Jay Rogers, you name it, those guys, you can just tell, are doing elite work, maximizing the potential of their depth players. Yeah, and that's something that Brandon Staley spoke about after the scrimmage in that you know, he was asked after you know giving an update on Sebastian Joseph Day's quad contusion, um, which officially has no timeline. I've seen some speculation out there online. There's no timeline for Sebastian Joseph Day. All we know is that it's a quad contusion. Mm-hmm. That's been the only com- confirmed uh, thing from the team. Um, you know, but after the the it, after the update on Sebastian Joseph Day, he was asked like, "Are you concerned about the depth along the defensive line?" And he said, "No. Like we feel great about the way that we've developed some of these players and how we're going to continue to develop some of these players." You mentioned Jay Rogers, who's one of the best coaches on the team, if not the best position coach. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's doing a, a great job. You know, this is really the first time where we had uh, gotten to see Gerard Clark, the undrafted free agent from Coastal Carolina. And he was working uh, a couple times against Joari Branch, a couple times against Brendan Hymas, a couple times against Jordan McFadden. And he was kind of living in the backfield. Like, he had, like, three or four great rushes Mm -hmm. against the run. And this was really the first time that we've seen from him. So, you know, maybe this is his opportunity to really kind of break out, so to speak, and start earning some more reps potentially with the first team. We've talked about Christopher Hinton several times. We didn't get to see uh, a ton of him making an impact in terms of, like, stat sheets. But you can – I guarantee if you go back and watch the film from the scrimmage that he would be out there as well. So – you know, the team likes where they're at with the interior defensive line. I know uh, fans would love to go see them sign somebody, but, you know, I think they're going to give these young players the chance to really earn it in the rest of the preseason and, and throughout the rest of the training camp. And um, a lot of them, like you mentioned, stood out on uh, Sunday night. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that they are. I understand some reservations about some of the players, right? Because they're unproven or they've or they're rookies and they're unproven or they just have never really made it in the league. I understand the reservations, but you can't help but look at those guys, edge rushers, D tackles, you name it, and just feel at least good about where you're headed. And even the DBs. I mean, you could argue the best DB on the field was Dean Leonard, the, the former seventh round pick yeah. who was who barely played in college at all, training camp standout last year, and has been almost lights out phenomenal. Um, and he got to go against the one. So really, DBs, linebackers, D tackles, edge rushers, Cannot feel good about the depth. Granted, you know, things change when, when these D tackles, maybe the former undrafted free agent is going up against Zach Martin in week six. 
you know, maybe things look different, but for now, like <laughs> it, it, this is depth, right? We have to kind of understand yeah. where these guys are and you feel really good about that. The fact that so many guys had like, I think like nine different guys had at least one or two pressures. I think like eight different guys had a sack. Like you got to feel good about your, your depth chart, at least right now. Yeah, kind of expanding on that, I would love to highlight the edge rush room in general. Mm-hmm. Um, you and I were both sitting there, and there were several rushes from Khalil Mack that were just kind of it left me with my jaw on the floor. Um, and I think a lot of times when we when we have these conversations, and not just me and you, like we meaning like general fan consensus, we kind of don't talk a whole lot about like the star players and like what they're doing and. You know, there's always the mention of Keenan Allen and stuff like that, but there's there hasn't really been a ton of buzz around what Khalil Mack has been doing. Um, and there were two or three reps against Foster Sorrell and, and Trey Pipkins, who was limited as well. I should have mentioned that earlier, but we'll get mm-hmm. into that in a second here. But there were some reps from Khalil Mack that just left me awestruck, man. Like, there was this speed-to-power rush that he put on Foster Sorrell, um, and he legitimately lifted him off of the ground. And if this were a game, it would have been a situation where <laughs> Foster Sorrell probably is really the one tackling the quarterback, but it really is Khalil Mack. It was an insane rush. And, and I do think that Foster, I'm not going to pick on Foster because I do think that, you know, he's he's taken some lumps against Khalil and Joey. But when he's gone up against the other edge rushers, I thought he's had some mm-hmm. really good moments, some great reps against Chris Rumpf on, on Sunday night, some great rumps, reps against uh, Tuli Tui Pelotu. But the things that Khalil can do to tackles who are not necessarily, you know, anchor heavy, it, it, it's just unreal. He's, he's the power that Khalil plays with is insane. I, I, I thought that he was the best player on the field on, on the scrimmage on Sunday night, which should be uh, a very positive takeaway. Um, I thought Tuli as well had some great moments. You know, there was this um, inside rush where he beat Jamari right off the. I think it might have been a stunt, but. He's so much quicker than you might think, you know, just based off of like, you know, his physical profile, but he, his get off is outstanding. And we've always heard about like the motor and like the tenacity that he plays with. And I thought his, his, his actual sack that they credited him with was a demonstration of that. The Chargers uh, offense did a fake play action bootleg. So they, they play action it left to the left. It was, and then Herbert booted back out to the right. And Zion Johnson pulled from left to right to to, to kick out Thule. Mm-hmm. And Thule just completely beat him to the spot. Like, it was not even close. And Zion is a freak athlete. Like, we all know what kind of physical <laughs> profile Zion has for his position. And Thule beat him to the spot and, and sacked Justin Herbert, like, instantly. Like, like, like Herbert turned around, and there was Thule right in his lap. So, um, it was a really positive day for the edge rushers. And I think, like I said, we need to give shine to the stars for doing star things yeah. for Khalil Mack. And then I thought Thule had his most disruptive day of camp, at least from what we've heard. You know, we, we haven't been at practice every day, but Thule had himself a really positive day as well. Yeah, the, these edge rushers. Um, so I have the official, like, not official. It's unofficial. It's very subjective. It's between our watch from the stands way up and from Daniel Popper's report. So um, I have the defense with, 22 pressures and 12 sacks on the day, um, nine different yeah. players with a sack and 13 different players had at least one pressure. And yeah, Khalil Mack, there are just players in the NFL. Like they're, they're the 1%, right? Everybody in the NFL, they're the 1% of the world because they can do this. And then there's like the percent of the percent that Khalil Mack and Rashawn Slater that these guys exist in. They're just a different tier than everybody else. And you can be a really good player. Some guys are just great, and that's Khalil Mack. So it's good to see that he's kind of picking up where he, he left off and certainly where he started last year as one of the most dominant forces on the team. And for him to continue with that so far is fantastic. And then Thule, mature beyond – they've said this, right, both with the mentality and his film study and also the you know how he plays and the way he plays. Mature beyond his years. I don't see you know a, a wide variety of maybe pass rush moves just yet, but he can do several things very well and well enough to succeed. And we saw that. I personally would have given him credit for two sacks, one on unbeaten Zion yeah. there, which you know, I don't know if that's really beating Zion, but the, the aggressiveness, the motor to get there um, was fantastic. And then the other sack that he had, um, a lot of bends, very powerful, very quick. Um, and to be able to do that at age 20 going on 21 it is so impressive. Um, the Chargers might have themselves like 
I don't want to say a steal because someone in the second round, I don't know if that's a steal, but I feel like Thule, I mean, I didn't even grade him because I feel like there was so much emphasis on other guys that I feel like he was always mm. overlooked in the discussion, maybe because people thought he was a D tackle or could be a linebacker or whatever. I don't know. But the Chargers said, you're going to be an edge rusher for us. And he goes, okay, Giff Smith, you know, has been working with him, uh, Joey Bosa, Kalimak, all these guys. And he looks fantastic. This is by far the best I've felt about edge rushers one through four in quite some time. You know, if you told me like Kyle Van Noy was going to be the edge three, edge four, whatever to start last season, you know, maybe I could say I'd feel about as good then too, but he was a linebacker sort of to start and really throughout training yeah. camp for them. So we really didn't know. And it took a while for him to get back into being an, you know, a very efficient edge rusher right now. If that's what Tuli can provide, I mean, okay, yes, not against the first team all the time, not against, you know, Lane Johnson, Trent Williams, whatever. But if that's what he can provide in a rotation and the Chargers really don't lose anything. Yeah, okay, sorry. Let me take that back. Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa are a different tier. But the fact that they don't have to completely lose their defense when they switch to that second group means a lot for this team. Because, I mean, Brandon Staley wants to bring the heat. And this is why they drafted, I mean, um, Tuli to Apple. Tuli to I can't do it. I've done it so well the last few weeks. <laughs> Tuli. Um, that's why they drafted him. Yeah, 100%. Uh, it's all good. You know, we mess up on names. I called Pokey Wilson Pokey Williams for like two shows. It's all good. Um, but yeah, this this edge rusher depth is is just in such a better spot from where it was at this time last year. And you can even throw in Ty Shelby, who's had himself yeah. a pretty good camp as well. He looked great on Sunday night. And, you know, I just feel so much more comfortable with where this like this three four and five spot at the mm -hmm. edge rusher group is right now we know that joey and khalil are going to do their things as long as they're on the field but you know the ability to blitz less i think is going to be really interesting because last year the chargers you know you, you hear brandon staley like vic vangio disciple like you don't picture somebody who blitzes a lot but they had to last year out of necessity mm -hmm. this year you know you can bring out a lineup with joey khalil Tuli, and morgan fox and you don't have to blitz because you have four really highly effective edge rush, uh, pass rushers in there. Chris Rump can work in there from time to time as well. And you feel great about it. And, you know, again, giving shine to somebody who doesn't necessarily get a lot because we just kind of expect it. Morgan Fox had himself a great day on Sunday night as well. And while you can maybe take the edge rusher performance with a bit of a grain of salt because of the offensive tackle injuries, Morgan Fox beat Zion for a sack. He beat Jamari for a sack. He beat Corey for a run stop. Like, Morgan Fox had himself a great day. And me and you were talking about how the great the interior offensive line was looking uh, on Sunday night. And Morgan Fox still was able to, you know, have himself a great and very disruptive performance on Sunday night as well. Yeah, if you want to say the interior offensive line, at least the starting trio, had like an A-minus performance on the day because they were so good, um, mostly throughout and really towards the end of the scrimmage. Sure. But the reason they don't have an A-plus is because of Morgan Fox. And he just, look, we're more positive, I think, like positive, neutral, sort of worst, but realistic. I don't think we ever go out of our way to be hype beasts by any means, right? I don't think we really go out to say every <laughs> player is going to be amazing and 35 sacks and all that. But I, I am really at a point where I, I do, and I tweeted as much yesterday, I do want to start considering, and I think he has to earn a bit, a bit Morgan Fox in that same tier as a pass rusher as Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack, at least in terms of where he is on the Chargers. There's always like, oh, there's these two edge rushers, and rightfully so. That's those guys. But I think you've got to include this third guy in that same sentence, right? And that's Morgan Fox. And it's something that the numbers point to. Yeah, I think it was like seventh mm -hmm. in pass rush productivity, 11th in win rate. Now he's going to be the full-time starter. And you just watch him on the field. You watched him on Saturday, you know, down at the field, on Sunday at the scrimmage. He's more powerful than ever. He can bend and, and flex more than I can certainly recall. You know, I think he's always been a yeah. good rusher, but I really don't recall this kind of power from him. So whatever it is, whatever he tapped into to end last season, part of that was just bulking up a little bit. It seems like he's picked up right where he left off. And I think he's going to be one of those elite defensive tackles um, in this league. I think he's been working towards that. It's year two in the system another year with coach ed another year with jay rogers and apparently he's been working on hot yoga so you know all these things come <laughs> together and i think morgan fox is going to be that guy this year and again he has to earn the right to be 
maybe considered in that same vein as Joey Bosa, Khalil Mack with the numbers, but I think he's going to get there. Yeah, we got a mention of Pilates and hot yoga on, on tonight's <laughs> show. Who would have thought? Um, but yeah, you know, Morgan Fox is having a great camp, and I think he's really a, kind of a forgotten man on the Chargers in general. You know, the defensive tackle market has really taken off around the NFL, and, and obviously the Chargers went out and paid Sebastian and, and Austin Johnson last year, and, and those two are always the ones that get mentioned when talking about the Chargers' defensive line room. And in terms of national, you know, notoriety, not a lot of people really talk about Morgan Fox in that same vein. But, um, you know, he's really starting to to prove, I think, within, the, you know, on the team that he's in that same kind of category. And you know, I think it's only a matter of time, especially now that those other guys are all injured, that people really start, you know, focusing on Morgan Fox. And kind of as an aside here, I love the fact that Scott Matlock gets to learn from him. You know, we've yeah. seen Thule have that kind of, you know, impact with the two guys. Quentin gets the wide receivers, and you know, in front of him, and Scott Matlock and Morgan Fox are very similar players in terms of their physical profiles, in terms of their positions, in terms of their styles. And you know, I think that's going to be a huge benefit this year and going forward for Scott Matlock to be able to learn from Morgan, as Morgan is really kind of ascending into this tier that we haven't seen him play at before. I love that. You, you always hear, and the questions always asked to the players, like you know, you get to learn from Keenan Allen, you get to learn from Joey Bosa. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But you also get to learn from Morgan Fox, and again by yeah, extension, 100%. like Jay Rogers as well. And Morgan Fox, he's he's been with several different teams, very complex systems. He's been an edge sort of rusher with Carolina, interior moved around, has found ways to even resurrect his own career um, in the middle of his career. Like he's, he was on his what third team once he got to the Chargers, and he found ways to improve against the run, even in like his what fifth or sixth year in the league. And Scott Matlock yeah. is a player that, again, another another player on the defensive line who had a nice little performance at the scrimmage. So, again, I, I think that's wonderful. I never really think of that. We never discuss Morgan Fox as like that, but he's a veteran. He's productive. He's really good. So, yeah, give him some credit there. Yeah, 100%. All right. Uh, shifting <laughs> gears here a little bit. I have to talk about the offensive struggles from Sunday night. Um, uh, again, the offensive tackle issues – were extremely prominent on Sunday night. So, again, no Rashawn Slater. Trey Pipkins is dealing with an undisclosed injury. We don't really know what's happening there. He was really playing like f three, four, five snaps on each drive, and then he would come out, and Austin Pleasance would come in and, and finish those drives. You know, so that that was kind of the issue with the first team. Normally, I feel like that would be Zach Bailey, who the team really trusts and has a lot of confidence in as kind of a swing guard tackle type of player. Um, he's also dealing with an undisclosed injury. And then, you know, we noticed uh, Nick Melsop on the sideline as well. He was in uh, he was on crutches. And so um, this offensive tackle depth was an issue. It got to the point during the scrimmage that Brendan Hymas, who I don't believe has ever played right tackle, was playing right tackle with the second team offense. And so it was it was an issue, and you have to talk about it. And I think there's a way to talk about it that really affects it, the offense from a negative perspective. Justin Herbert did point out that they did have some positive drives at the end, so they were able to kind of workshop it and figure it out and, and send some chip help and send some double team help and things like that. And those are things that you have to do in the season. You know, we saw mm -hmm. them do it last year with the injuries to Rashawn Slater and Trey Pipkins. And so that you have to acknowledge what happened. The offensive tackle depth is, is an issue right now, just from a health perspective, but I'm not concerned about it long term. It's just like a functionality point because Rashawn should come back, you know, hopefully sooner rather than later after this illness. Trey Pipkins should continue to improve from his injury. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Zach Bailey, as far as we know. But you have to mention that the offensive tackle depth definitely, uh, you know, was tested on Sunday night. Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to the, the positive for a second there. It is nice to see that the offense did find a way to punch back. And if you 100%. gave them another half an hour of the first team working or second team, whatever, you might have walked away from that scrimmage feeling very differently. And I think we appreciate seeing that a team, again, this is kind of the end of the, the scrimmage, but last year in the third quarter in particular, and to close out games, the offense really couldn't figure it out. Or because there were injuries or players were missing mm. for whatever reason, the offense just kind of 
that was it. Like they needed the star players to succeed. When those guys weren't out there, they really couldn't figure it out unless Justin Herbert unless Justin Herbert pulled a miracle. You know, this time it really felt like they found a way to settle in. And listen, Brandon Staley was throwing a lot at this offense. Um, I don't want to say unfairly so, but you're missing two of your tackles, and he's like, get everybody, send everybody, blitz, 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 blitz. Um, <laughs> but good, good. I'm glad you're yeah. doing that to simulate some of these in-game situations you'll see against the Ravens, against the Patriots, and, and stuff like that. So um, them bouncing back with that final score, with that red zone score, you know, getting the quote-unquote game-winning field goal in the two-minute drill was fantastic. But... The Chargers really need to look themselves in the mirror and, and ask if this is really the offensive tackle situation, obviously the, the depth, that they feel could carry them deep into the postseason. Uh, we've talked about this too many times, I think, at this point. Um, 2019, Phillip Rivers last year. Phillip Rivers, future Hall of Famer, one of my favorite players of all time, if not my favorite player of all time, and, uh, for the Chargers. 2019, disaster at tackle. 2020, Justin Herbert's first year, disaster. Shane Steichen's offense couldn't even really express itself because they didn't have the blocking. Granted, that was kind of a, an entire line thing, not as much the tackles, but still. And then 2021, you got to have it in a game against the Raiders. You and I were there. And your, your, your swing tackle, your backup tackle that you had watched throughout the entire year and you didn't really do anything about, um, which I understand like having some faith in him, but... At some point, they maybe should have brought somebody else in to at least try something. And in that got to have a game, 11 pressures and two sacks allowed. We're standing there. The Chargers lose, um, not because of Storm Norton, but it would have helped to not have 11 pressures and two sacks allowed. Last year, that situation, the tackle situation wasn't great. So to watch the Chargers then go out in this year, Brandon Staley's third year, the, the fifth of the years that I just mentioned, and at the scrimmage for these tackles to give up you know, eight sacks and 13 pressures to the edge rushers. It's just, it's just very frustrating. Um, and at, at some point, I, I think they have to look themselves in the mirror and say, if this like, are we going to repeat the mistakes that we have before? Or are we going to maybe just bring in one more guy, which we really haven't done. Like the, the Chargers have always like kind of had some faith in a guy, but they've never like, made like, a like, just in case option, you know, break glass in case of emergency sort of option. Now, that was Jamari last year, but that was kind of like a, oh, shoot, I didn't know I had that, and then it worked out. So as a fan, and we are fans, I'm just, I'm just concerned because I've seen this before. I've seen it in person. I've seen it for several years, different quarterbacks, different coaches. The inability to truly find a legit backup option at tackle, which I think Foster could be trending towards. And I don't want to say he's been bad. I don't think it's even really was a Foster Serral thing on Sunday, but no, it really wasn't. I, I'm just I'm just concerned, and I think every Chargers fan would agree that the inability to find that real tackle depth for the last four or five years, maybe all of Telesco's tenure, I don't know, has been part of the reason they've struggled so much to close out seasons, to get into the postseason, and then win when they're there. Yeah, I. I don't want to like harp too much on that because this was an extreme situation, really, because you're down basically three offensive tackles. You know, you're down the best, arguably the best left tackle in the league. You're down a, an above average right tackle, basically. And then your fourth offensive tackle couldn't play either. And so, you know, if it got to that point in a game, I think Jamari would just kick out to right tackle. You know, I, I think that would be the case and I think we would feel a whole lot better about that situation uh, and then maybe you insert Zach Bailey at guard or, or whatever the case may be at guard Jordan McFadden can step in there so I, I think the Chargers have some in-season moves that they could be able to make to shore up that kind of spot if that were to happen it's a striking reality again that the offensive tackle depth around the league is it lacking in comparison to the pass rusher depth and this is not this is not an issue just for the chargers you know i don't know who else watched the hall of fame game but i did and you know the jets eighth edge rusher had like three sacks <laughs> you know and the browns fourth edge rusher had like four sacks it was it's an issue everywhere like mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of young offensive tackle depth coming into the league right now but it's still an issue and, and, and the chargers are, are not the only team struggling with this and this was an extreme situation they were able to workshop it and figure it out. My concern is just from a functionality standpoint, like how are you going to be able to practice 
and handle this offensive transition over the next couple of weeks because this week it might not be a huge issue. You know, I don't know if they're going to have padded practices this week, but next week you have joint practices with the Saints, you know, and you have a preseason game coming up with the Rams. And so you have these very important opportunities. And if Zach Bailey is still struggling with his injury, if whatever is going on with this illness thing spreads to other players, you know, you're asking a guy like Brennan Hymas to play right tackle when he's never done that. And again, extreme situation. I understand why you make that decision. Um, but then if an injury happens, like, do you have yeah. enough bodies? That's my concern Yeah, is just being able to like accurately practice and demonstrate and express your offense in these games. Give guys like John Hightower, Isaiah Spiller, these valuable reps and be able to maximize those reps. That's my concern more so than like, Hey man, like Khalil Mack had a couple sacks, and Tuli Tuli Pelota had a couple sacks in the in a Sunday night scrimmage game. Yeah, it's more just the projection to the regular season ahead, considering the regular seasons that we've seen. That's kind of more my more concern there. But yeah, I I, I understand the the point that they make to try to get like if you're going to be a bubble player, if you're going to really not even start, maybe some special teams, maybe an extra lineman, you know, on some packages. You know, as Tom Telesco has said, you you better be able to play more than just one position. So I, under, yeah. I do understand that argument to a certain sense because they've tried out Bailey at different spots and they've tried at several at different sides of the line. Um, they've tried out Hymas. We saw him try to play tackle. Sawyer they kicked out last year to tackle. I, I get that sense of things, but then like you said, there, there's a functionality to just being able to practice and then eventually you know just play in the regular season that like some guys maybe are, are just guards or, or they should just practice there or, or something and that sometimes you just probably should just find a tackle who's a tackle and for better or worse at least you have a tackle out there playing tackle and everything else can kind of just be a nice constant understanding of what responsibilities are yeah so we'll see what happens i I think again from a regular season perspective i think you feel great about where the Chargers are at one through eight um and and i will say like i I mentioned briefly there were some reps that foster sorrell had Mm -hmm. on sunday night where he looked really, really good. He's definitely improved from what we saw last season. Um, you know, he, he put in a lot of work training with Duke Manningweather, and he deserves a lot of credit there. Just looks a little bit more comfortable, more fluid with his with his reps, with his timing, with his punching. Um, I think this was the first time that he played left tackle, at least in training camp. I can't remember if he, he did a mu- much of left tackle last season, but... This training camp, he's been mostly working with right tackle. Granted, Trey's been dealing with his his, his injury thing. Um, but I thought Foster looked good when he was, you know, he took some lumps against Khalil, but I thought he looked pretty good against the other guys. Mm-hmm. And maybe he is able to become that reliable swing tackle. We'll see. You know, it seems like he's certainly improved, and I, I think the Chargers would love to see that come to fruition. So, um, again, have to talk about the offensive line depth because people were asking us, like, all these, you know, sky is falling questions. I'm not there at that point yet. Again, um, this was an extreme situation. You still have a great, you know, starting tackle duo. And we'll see what happens with Foster Sorrell and Zach Bailey. The Chargers like them a lot more than I think the fan base does. Uh, and like I said, I feel like Foster has taken some legitimate steps forward. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how this goes in, in the next couple of weeks. But from a functionality standpoint, if this continues, I, I would like to see them add another body or two to be able to at least function and evaluate the offense properly. Yeah. Once you get in these preseason games, the joint practices against the Saints, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and one more positive from that, kind of harping back to the improvement from the offense at the end of the scrimmage. They did start to figure it out. They did a, find a way to establish the run. Thank goodness. Um, and they also found a way to, I, I think they only took three deep shots with the first team offense. Um, I think maybe one or two to, to Mike and certainly one to Keenan. And Dean Leonard was in on at least two of those deep passes. But at least they were there, you know, like they had to find a way to chip away at certain things because the defensive yeah. line was bringing it. But at least Kellen Moore like found a way to, OK, like, we're at least going to try to keep the defense right. honest and take a couple of shots to these guys, which is good. Like that, that is a bit of a sigh of relief to someone like me who's, you know, watched this offense last year. Yeah. And those are things that are going to have to have to happen during the season. You know, mm-hmm. this team plays arguably the best defensive front in the league with the Dallas Cowboys in week six. And maybe they got maybe they're just like firing on all cylinders, and you're gonna have to figure out how to pass protect against that unit. You know, we saw them last year have to figure it out against the 49ers, two years ago against 
Miles Garrett and Miles Garrett and the plan that they had initially with Miles Garrett wasn't working and they had to adjust and Rashawn had to adapt and, and you know they were able to figure it out and come back and score and win that game. Mm-hmm. So these are things that you have to workshop and, and Justin Herbert pointed it out afterwards and I thought they did a pretty good job of it. We saw Mr. Justin Herbert use his legs, which was great to see. You know, had a couple scramble drills out there. Easton Stick did as well and Max Duggan too. So again, I, I thought the offense handled themselves well. Once they adjusted to the pressure that was happening, um, and you know, I, in terms of standouts, I thought Easton Stick had himself a pretty good day. I know he threw the the one interception to to Mark Webb, but outside of that, I think Easton Stick is another guy who has really taken some steps yeah. forward this year. Um, had a couple really solid throws to Mr. John Hightower, who's kind of been the the biggest standout of camp, who continues to show up and impress. Um, but yeah, I, I liked seeing how the quarterbacks handled that pressure and were able to kind of problem solve on the fly with the offense and be able to you know uh handle the ship as as best as they could yeah that was the best i've seen easton stick look in in quite some time um if not ever and it's unfortunate because so much won't show up i'm doing the recap and looking through my notes of what happened during that scrimmage a lot of things didn't count there was a holding penalty um there was just a, a freak oh they almost had it you know there's a beautiful football to john hightower and a beautiful catch and it was just like yep. this much away from being a uh, completion. He just barely missed it, um, but Hightower caught it. They just stepped out of bounds. Um, but that was really good to see because we've seen Easton Stick, the playmaker. We really haven't seen him develop into like a game manager, a mover of the football for the offense, keep things flowing. And he really did that. So that was really impressive. Another player that I think um, we have a lot of or have had a lot of question marks about, certainly the fan base has, is Trey McKitty. And I think that you know, Brandon Staley after the scrimmage said, you know, he's got to earn it. He's got to improve. It's a big offseason, big preseason for him. And it is. Um, but I, I do want to give Trey McKitty some credit here because watching him pull a couple of times, um, we both saw the same pull against Chris Rumpf. Fantastic. Uh, I think he had three catches on the day. He set up what ended up being the quote unquote game winning field goal for Cameron Dicker. You know, do I expect him to be Travis Kelsey? No. But to just get out there and have three quality receptions and make quality blocks yeah. as part of the first team was really, really great to see. So i got to give him some credit there, too. Yeah, he's another guy. He went down to tight end U. He's put in the work. He's improved a lot. Um, and I think we're seeing some glimpses of that, especially as, as a pass catcher. You know, I, I want to say it was, uh, was it Wednesday when they had a pad of practice that was closed to the public that he had – uh, I think Daniel Popper wrote about yep. this, you know, a, a beautiful deep out. It was Herbert's best throw of the day, but like he created some separation, you know, he was able to win downfield. So maybe this is a, a sign of things to come for Trey McKitty. And, and I think the chargers would, would love to see that development as well. Uh, like Brandon Staley mentioned. So I, I thought he had a good scrimmage. I really do. Yeah. Um, there were some other couple blocks that he had on the perimeter. You mentioned the, the poll on, on Chris Rump. I thought he had a really solid day. And then like you mentioned, you know, for, Herbert to go to him in the you know most important moment of that two minute drill, yeah, I think shows a lot of of trust that Herbert has kind of developed with him, and so you know I, I think that's a really spot on situation. Um, obviously, the kicker has to convert in that situation, and Mr. Cameron Dicker did yeah. convert in that situation. Um, I guess we can kind of wrap up here unless you have any other thoughts. But uh, Cameron Dicker was ten for ten on mm. Sunday night, so he continues to have himself a good camp. You pointed out um, when everybody else was kind of stretching and warming up, he was kicking off to the far side of the field um, and hitting comfortably from like 55 plus. So, Mm -hmm. um, again, I think Cameron Dicker is is having having himself a great camp and uh, trending towards winning the Chargers kicking battle at this point. Yeah, it seems to be all but wrapped up. Um, You know, if it were even throughout camp, maybe they'd go with the veteran. But it's been one sided. It's been lopsided at this point. And Cameron Dicker, I forget, is it 39 of 43 throughout camp so far? Um, I think he's officially rounded into like that 90% um, so far through the kicks that have counted. So the numbers look great. I'm so glad that they're giving him this many opportunities because we've seen a three kicker battle before. It's like, okay, you get three kicks each of you today. Yeah. Cameron Dicker gets like 10, sometimes eight, nine, 10 per day. So you're really getting to see him actually take legitimate reps and they're building data on him it's it's very simple statistics but they get to see like plenty of 50 yarders 40 yarders 30 yarders etc and they feel great i'm I'm sure they have to feel great um once again once again ryan figgin like things work out on special teams 
because of Ryan Ficken, who's awesome. So great to see. Um, and yeah, from far away, he tried some 60 yarders. I think they were off by like a yard, but it almost felt like he was like, he was almost, it was dead center. <laughs> it was just off by a yeah. yard or two. And, and hopefully in a game, bit of adrenaline, bit of a gust of wind, you know, he'll make those 63 yarders. Yeah. You know, when he's in Denver, he can definitely, <laughs> yeah, no problem. Easy peasy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, you mentioned just the volume of kicks, like he's already at 40 plus kicks and like the previous kicker battles we're we're not seeing that kind of volume from, from the kicking battles. So this is a lot of very valuable practice reps for Cameron Dicker. Um, you could tell after Sunday night that he was a little bit, a little bit winded, but Hey, you know, kicking 10 <laughs> times, I can't imagine what that's like after doing all those uh, other practice reps as well. So feel very comfortable with where he's at. Ryan Ficken expressed as much on uh, Saturday as well that they love where Cameron Dicker is at. And uh, I'm excited to see him be able to express that throughout the rest of the preseason and, and workshop maybe some uh, longer distance kicks with the uh, second and third team offenses. Yeah, let's go for it. Uh, you know what? The, the team actually did go for it quite a bit on fourth down. It didn't matter. It was a scrimmage, and it won't matter in the preseason. Um, I think there were, was some success there at least. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, all right, Tyler, any other uh, final thoughts before we head out for the evening? Uh, the next time we talk to you guys, it'll be after actual football that doesn't count, and I'm very, very excited. Yeah, it should be a, a ton of fun. Um, there's some other videos happening between the recording of this and uh, the publishing of this episode. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the uh, Hot Ones episode with Justin Herbert and Easton Stick and uh, some other video that we can't uh, spoil at this time. So... Um, appreciate everybody for tuning in this has been a, a great conversation with eric kendricks hopefully you guys enjoyed the recap of the scrimmage on a sunday night um thanks so much for the chargers again for uh, giving us this opportunity this platform and thanks to greg kim for producing thanks tyler for uh joining me as always that's gonna do it for us tonight we'll see you guys next time and as always bolt up